Hi, my name is Dr. Bruce Quinn. In this video, we'll talk about a major new decision that CMS re released in proposed form on Friday night, October 16th, uh, why it's important, what it's going to do, what companies it affects, and what the major impacts are, why this is worth knowing about. After the first four or five minutes, when we give you this overview, there'll be a break and we'll switch to a deep dive for people that want to keep watching. And for another eight or nine minutes, I'll talk about where the laws came from, what the history of this is going back to the 1990s, and exactly how the wheels turn inside the clock, so to speak, so you can really have uh, expertise in exactly what Medicare did and, and what its implications are. So without further ado, let's move on to the talk. And here we go. CMS proposes rolling coverage of future colorectal cancer screening tests by liquid biopsy, what happened, what's new, and some background. So this is what Medicare did. It released a proposed national coverage decision. Uh, it was released on Friday evening, October 16th, after markets closed. That's important because these can be market swinging events. Uh, it is a proposed decision, so it's in comment period until November 15th. What CMS proposes to do is to cover liquid biopsy tests, blood tests that look for cancer DNA, to cover liquid biopsy tests to screen for colon cancer, only for colorectal cancer. The test has to have FDA approval and 74% sensitivity and 90% specificity, specifically against a gold standard of colonoscopy. Uh, plus, there's more. The test also, besides FDA, has to be endorsed by the US Public Services Task Force uh, or by a major clinical guideline or association. Once it's got those things, the test is covered, what it's priced at will be set by other Medicare rules and policies that are found in other places for pricing new lab tests. The corporate context is important and it's unusual here. The index test and most of what the decision talks about is the epigenomics epipro colon test. Um, which, however, does not meet the CMS proposed guidelines for a test that it would cover now or in the future. It's a little bit like if you're 24 years old and you were campaigning for some new voter registration law uh, and it gets passed by your state, but it's for people 25 or older, so it wouldn't involve you. Uh, but there are major tests in the pipeline from some large companies with 10 to $20 billion market caps like Exact Sciences and Garden Health. Uh, and there are very large FDA trials going on for these companies, circa 10,000 patients. Why 10,000 patients? Well, only about 1% will actually have colorectal cancer. So out of 10,000 patients, 100 will have colorectal cancer. And FDA really needs to look at the performance in those 100 patients, some with lower grade, lower size, larger grade, higher grade, larger size, and so on. So you have to go sift through 10,000 patients to find uh, several dozen patients that actually have cancer, and you're really studying those. This stuff can really swing markets. Back on September 24th, Exact Sciences in a press conference said it had good data in this field, and the market cap shot up from $70 a share to $100. That's $5 billion of market cap uh, just based on preliminary data. So this is definitely a field where billions of dollars of market cap are flowing around. And until now, there have been some pretty substantial hurdles that Medicare put in the way of coverage. Medicare would not normally cover a new preventive test unless it has FDA approval, so no lab developed tests, only FDA approved tests, and United States Public Task Force endorsement, which can take several years easily. And then after that, sequentially, a new additional national coverage test review, which takes another 12 months. So there's a multi-year pathway in place after FDA approval which looked pretty forbidding. And this proposed decision would leapfrog over that and give almost instant coverage uh, with the new test. Here's the context of the proposal. Um, basically on the left, if you have any test, drug, procedure, or therapy, you ask, is it for current symptoms of disease, current signs and symptoms of disease? If the answer is yes, you go downward uh, and there is regular coverage for such a test. Um, through local and national coverage decisions. If the answer, however, is no, uh, then you move to this other pathway called preventive services pathways. And that's much slower, unfortunately. Um, there are three ways to get a new preventive services test. One, if it's directly named by Congress. So they've 
House and Senate pass a law, they create a new benefit for Medicare, the president signs it, doesn't happen very often, but that's where we got mammography and pap smears from laws passed in the 1990s. Then there's a direct legislative option that lets Medicare uh, directly create a benefit, but only if it's for colorectal cancer or prostate cancer. Medicare's been able to do that since 1997, although it's only done it a few times. And finally, the third pathway stems from 2008. And Congress said that any service that is already endorsed by the U.S. Public Services Task Force, there are about 50 or 60 of those, can be taken up and created as a Medicare benefit, but only through the national coverage decision process, which takes a year or more and takes time to get the agency's uh, uh, attention to want to do it and decide to do it. So how do you uh, fit this into this? Uh, we're squarely in pathway number two. Medicare can directly create an NCD if, the cancer is colorectal cancer or prostate cancer. And that's what we're seeing in this proposed decision. How do you get into any of these? Well, for the first one, a legislative benefit, you need patient groups, associations, voters, lobbyists, action on the Hill. For the second one, for CMS to open an NCD, you need to convince CMS leadership that the new colon test or prostate test should be a CMS preventive service. And that's what is happening right now, uh, that we're in the midst of the comment period. And then the third pathway, if the service has already gone through several years to be approved by the U.S. Public Services Task Force and endorsed and finalized, then serially Medicare could elect to take it up as a benefit. But again, you'd have to have a lot of stakeholders and associations convincing Medicare that this is worth doing and that it should be a selected benefit out of the 50 or 60 possible benefits. This is the last slide in this section, and I'll provide links uh, below if you're on the YouTube page. Uh, there's a tracking sheet, which is a home page for this decision. There is a draft proposal, which is 30 or 40 pages long if you print it out as a PDF. There's a comment box on top. The comments are active till November 15th. And finally, I provide a link to my own blog from October 16th or 17th where you can read about this. So that was the introductory section. Uh, we will now move on to the deep dive and, uh, as I said, understanding how the gears are turning inside the clock. So. Going back to the beginning in 1965, Medicare had several pretty simple concepts. To get paid by Medicare, you had to be a recognized category of provider, like a physician, a hospital, a clinical laboratory, or a few others. You had to provide something called medical and other health services, but not anything you thought was a medical or health service. It had to be defined in law, Social Security Act 1861. And health services are defined as A, physician services, B, hospital services, C, ambulance services, D, diagnostic tests, and so on. That's where eventually things like mammography got added as a defined health service. Things then are not covered. Eyeglasses, not covered. Hearing aids, dental care, not covered. And finally, services not reasonable and necessary to treat disease are not covered. And this is where we got the idea that we don't cover preventive benefits, except when you jump through these extra rings and hoops. They figured out early on that a pap smear, why it might be billed by a clinical laboratory and provided as a diagnostic test and be the service of a physician or ordered by a physician, that pap smear is not necessary to treat disease, which is part of Medicare's law. So it's viewed as not being a Medicare benefit uh, initially. So they decided you had to have signs and symptoms of a disease in order for example, a diagnostic test to be payable. If you don't have signs and symptoms of disease, it's a preventive service, it's not payable, but this concept of a preventive service or this concept of signs and symptoms of disease doesn't actually occur in the Medicare statute. They've sort of inferred it. They've inferred that uh, preventive benefits are not covered. So there is a history of prevention. It starts in 1991 with the introduction of coverage for mammograms for the first time. That's only 30 years ago and when the program was about 25 years old. Uh, there was more coverage of screening tests with the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. That's when we got uh, better benefits from mammography. We added pap smears, prostate screening tests, colorectal co uh, cancer screening, and several others, 1997. This is what these laws and regulations look like. I do not recommend you try to read this. It reads like tax law, but this is actually how Medicare defines the benefit from mammography. It takes multiple paragraphs to say that a woman can get a mammogram every year. Uh, and here is something that's interesting. It's the rule for colorectal cancer screening tests. 
This is where this new national coverage decision fits. And the 1997 law says that a colorectal cancer screening test means any of the following. A, a fecal occult blood test. They had those in 1997. Screening flexible, flexible sigmoidoscopy. Almost nobody gets that, but it's covered. And finally, screening colonoscopy, which is sort of the standard of care in the United States. In most other countries, it's a very expensive test, not a standard of preventive care. And finally, look at D. Other such tests or procedures with frequency and payment as the secretary determines appropriate in consultation with organizations. So D lets Medicare create new kinds of tests, molecular tests or other tests, that it finds appropriate. And there's similar language for prostate cancer. But only colorectal cancer and only prostate cancer have this extra clause that the secretary can create new benefits when it, uh, when it chooses to. There's a third broad, thin, slow, long pathway to coverage, which is from Medicare Improvement Act of 2008. If a service has a U.S. Public Services Task Force A or B rating, it's endorsed by the U.S. PSTF, uh, and also Medicare decides to pluck it out and do a national coverage decision on it, which probably takes a year, may take longer to decide to do anything, um, then you can make that U.S. Public Services Task Force benefit into a Medicare coverage benefit. But this takes several years and it requires the U.S. Public Services Task Force to act first, and as we'll see, that could take years. So in summary, the three channels are Congress directly writes a law for the benefit, like mammography 1991, or the service is created through this technology update, but only if it's colorectal cancer or prostate cancer. And that's the channel that the exact Cologuard test went through uh, in about 2014. It's now Medicare's largest molecular test at about $300 million a year. And there's this third channel which follows behind uh, like a caboose uh, of something that the U.S. Public Services Task Force has done. And that's a good channel, but it takes years to get something new into that. So here's the fly in the ointment. All these preventive services channels are slow. And that's why there was so much excitement about this new future-looking, uh, forward-looking decision that we got October 16th. So the U.S. Public Services Task Force for timelines are four to 10 year intervals for updating a guidance document. When it does, it probably had a cutoff on new literature a year in the past. The process at Public Services Task Force literally takes two years. There's no mechanism for doing review in a brand new category, something out of the box. They can do so, but it's really, really rare that they do. Um, and it's unclear exactly what outcomes, data, and replications the Public Services Task Force would have to have for something that's truly out of the box and novel. Uh, maybe the FDA approves it on one large clinical trial. Is that enough for Public Services Task Force, one large trial? Maybe not, maybe they want three large trials, who knows? Now, in the last few days since the decision was released October 16th, US Public Services Task Force has released a new draft decision for colorectal cancer screening tests of all types. It just came out in draft form. It's in a comment period. There's a link in the fine print toward the bottom. It won't get finalized until well into 2021, maybe late 2021. And that shows that this is a five or six year cycle because the last one was from 2015, 2016. Uh, then the NCD timeline, there's a variable consideration period before Medicare even opens an NCD. Um, the epigenomics letter was from early 2019 and they'd probably been talking to Medicare for a year or two before that. Medicare didn't do anything until uh, into 2020. It produces a draft decision in late 2020. That's now. It'll finalize this sometime out in 2021. So it'll be several years from the time that the company started talking to them. There is the possibility of something called parallel review, but I almost hate to mention that because it's done so rarely, only twice in 10 years. Uh, it's very hard to get into that process. It it's, can actually be pretty opaque to get into it. Um, <clears throat> and then the NCD process might take only a few months instead of a year. If you have a non-colon and non-prostate preventive test, remember, CMS can't do a decision on it until after the Public Services Task Force. So you wouldn't have this parallel review um, pathway. So let's summarize that graphic graphically. You've put tens of million dollars, hundred million dollars into your product, uh, years of trial, publication, going through FDA review, and then finally you get FDA approval and you face this U.S. Public Services Task, Task Force gateway. 
They're not going to open a review for three or four years. It'll take them two years to finish it. There's a five-year chunk of time. Then when it's done, CMS opens the NCD gateway. That takes another round of convincing and cajoling and meetings and months and quarters go by, and the NCD takes a year. And finally, you get to the right where you have a Medicare benefit. Now, I should also mention there are some gray areas uh, when a preventive service is preconditioned on a patient's having some condition to get the preventive test, and the condition sounds kind of like a disease, uh, then it sort of slides into a screening test, preventive test, um, medical care for the disease, which is the condition that triggers the screening test. It gets complicated. And I give you an example here. There's Medicare preventive service bone mass measurement, but it actually started out as a benefit for medically necessary bone mass tests if you were estrogen deficient, if you had hyperparathyroidism, if you were on steroids for more than three months. Uh, so uh, it's really a benefit for treating certain diseases needing bone mass measurement to manage them and not really a preventive benefit at all. That's a little side channel, but there is a gray area between screening tests and diagnostic tests for sure. So I'm gonna close with a proposal of my own, uh, and that's that Medicare should be allowed through new law to just do an NCD for preventive service regardless of the US Public Services Task Force weight or its backlog or whether it has time to get to something. Um, in the current state, uh, Medicare National Coverage Review essentially copies and duplicates what U.S. Public Services has done anyway. Let's say there are 10 publications in a field. U.S. Public Services Task Force spends a year reviewing them and writes a 30-page report. That triggers Medicare to spend a year reviewing the same 10 papers and writing the same 30-page report again. So having this stacked sequence between Public Services Task Force, then Medicare, doesn't really accomplish anything. It's merely duplicative. I'll tell you another thing too. Medicare since 1997, almost 25 years, has had the ability to create new colorectal cancer screening benefits or new prostate cancer screening benefits, and it's almost never done so. This is only the third time it's done so in 25 years with this proposed decision this month. So Medicare has clearly showed that if you give it the ability to create new cancer screening tests, uh, it will do so prudently and at long intervals and only when there's adequate data. So Congress should just give Medicare the ability to do this for other cancers like pancreatic and um, ovarian like it has for colorectal. So in summary, everything we talked about, Medicare law goes back to 1965, but preventive benefits only since 1991. Those were the fully enumerated statutory benefits like mammography. Then there was a package of preventive benefits in 1997, and then the U.S. Public Services Task Force pathway beginning in 2008. But we're still struggling, struggling how to handle out-of-the-box technologies. And the U.S. Public Services Task Force bottleneck for a new ovarian cancer preventive test or a new bladder cancer or pancreatic cancer preventive test uh, could be very slow. So we, we will need to figure out a way of doing this faster. And I think this points a way to just let Medicare directly create the benefits when it needs to do so. Thank you very much for listening. I'm providing my email. If you want to reach out to me with a question, I'll try to answer it. And thank you very much.